Hey everyone, and most especially every fan that's watching today. Hope you're doing amazing. I'm your host, Francis, Game Marketing Director here at Become Today, and I'm joined with two of my colleagues, Pierre and Wyatt. And we have a very special guest for you guys, James Jacob, Pathfinder Creative Director here at Paizo. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Sure. Um, uh, so I'm Pierre, uh, nice to meet you uh, all. And I'm an executive producer at Become Studios. I've been working uh, at Become for four years, uh, but I've been working as a game producer for 20 years now. And I have to admit something to you guys. I, I We have a thrill with this project. I it, 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 I, have, I feel the best, best vibe I've ever seen, ever felt in a project. Um, we have a lot of fun uh, during this production. So um, the the team is uh, super excited. The team is awesome. I have the, I have the dream team, as I say often. Uh, so, um, so working on Abomination Vaults is a, is a bliss, and I'm happy, very happy here uh, to be uh, here today to talk about that with you. And uh, hi, I'm Wyatt Gray. I'm the creative director on Pathfinder Abomination Vaults game, uh, and a longtime fan and player of both first and second edition Pathfinder. <laughs> James, anything you want to add for yourself? Or oh, uh, <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, I'm James Jacobs. Uh, I'm the narrative creative director for uh, Pathfinder at Paizo. I've been at Paizo pretty much the entire time I, I joined the company a year after it was founded. And I, I've been working on game related content there for a long time. Uh, Abomination Vaults is an adventure I helped to write and I'm uh, pretty excited to it got chosen to become uh, this, this game. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Uh, today's discussion will be split in three parts. So we'll have our game design and pillars, uh, followed by the story of the Abomination Vaults, and finally our gameplay, uh, how it's structured. So uh, let's start quickly with an easy one. Uh, in a nutshell, could you explain to us what is Pathfinder Abomination Vaults, uh, Wyatt? Sure. So sure. Abomination sure. Vaults is a hack and slash action RPG based on the amazing second edition of the Pathfinder role playing game. Um, our game is based on the famous tabletop adventure path of the same name. Uh, players lead iconic Pathfinder heroes into the endless depths beneath the Gauntlet Keep and battle through the hordes of deadly monsters and abominations to reach the powerful Banshee sorceress Belcora Haravex and put an end to her evil plans. And what platforms could we expect the game? So the, the game is uh, meant to be released on Steam first. Uh, we'll see about the other platforms uh, as we go further into development. We would love to see this game on console, but the future will tell. Uh, we are currently on Kickstarter, so the campaign will launch very soon. So be sure to hit the notify me button so that you are informed as soon as the campaign starts. Awesome. And uh, as for the settings, could you explain a bit what are Gauntlet, Gauntlet Keep and the Abomination Vaults? Sure. So level, because I think we're going to talk a little bit more about the story you know, a little later. Um, but 500 years ago, uh, Belcora Harvex built Gauntlet Keep as her base of operations from which to raise an evil horde to enact her revenge against the nearby major city of Absalom. But brave heroes had battled into Gauntlet Keep and defeated Belcora. What the world didn't know is that she was hiding a massive dungeon underneath the keep where her army of darkness was hidden away. And 500 years of roughly have passed and now the magical light atop gauntlet keep has begun to shine again so our four heroes have arrived each with their own reasons to enter that keep and face its dangers and invest Belcor, uh, investigate belcora's return and they're going to be discovering the abomination vaults no pressure of doing that uh, <laughs> that brief before james right <laughs> it sounds awesome uh and now how is it implemented in the game settings so the vaults are divided into 10 major sections um, it's got everything from fiery prisons to ancient libraries uh, to coliseums and evil temples. So there's this diversity of biomes hidden down there for the players to discover. And can player expect to face different foes in each of those in those sections? Yes, uh, that's right. Each biome has different foes, different hazards, and different abominations for the players to overcome. And that's everything from undead cultists fiery fiends to horrifying monstrosities and everything in between. Uh, and each of these enemies have different strengths and weaknesses. So players will need to look out for that uh, and adapt their strategy if they want to succeed in battle. And if I may add something about the, the bestiary, because the bestiary is just insanely big, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to read it. Um, and, uh, 
there will be a lot of boss battles. I love boss battle, boss battles. It's 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 all about the abominations, right? So um, players will have to face down uh, intense boss uh, bosses, and uh, there will be a wide range of of of, of them uh, with different patterns. So what I love playing uh, those battles is like um, is that you have to understand the patterns. Um, uh, uh, observe what's going on and uh, feel what the weaknesses are, uh, the resistance, and also um, adapt your strategy to the different waves of minion waves or uh, the environmental hazards that could occur. And um, and I, I love I love those challenges as a personal player because you um, you have to observe, adapt your um, uh, your your tactics, but also you need to be very um, time. You need to time your your attacks. And sometimes you need help, right? So you could, you could in this game, you can ha ask for friends to join you and defeat uh, specific uh, bosses if they're you. You consider them them a little bit um, uh, the challenge to be a little bit too high. So that that's uh, or you can just continue um, um, working uh, the the battle and find the solutions by yourself. I, I, I like the the challenges because they're very rewarding. Um, so it's it would be uh, probably my favorite moments in the game. Yeah, sounds super exciting. Um, I was also uh, quite like, are we finding ourselves only in a dungeon, or can player expect to see other places? That's a great question, and the answer is yes. Every party needs somewhere where they can rest, catch their breath between adventures, and the cozy village of Otari waits for our players, uh, where they can kind of catch their breath, go upgrade their gear, take on a quest maybe learn a little bit more about the world and the area and the history of the town and the dungeon, or just kick back, grab a ale at the tavern and, and relax. Um, and that village also has space for the advanced shopkeepers, which are going to be listed in our stretch goals, um, such as the runesmith, the tailor, the apothecary, um, and each of them is ready to help you, you know, customize your strategy, power up, and overcome the odds to push ever deeper into the vaults. Yeah, T talking about the players, like what, what can we tell about the characters of the game? Yeah, I'm sure White will talk about, about them, but uh, you can embody uh, Ezran the Wizard, uh, Amuri the Barbarian, Kira the Cleric, and Hask the Ranger. Um, and I think this 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 team is awesome. Yeah, so, um, it's a classic, you know, we've got a classic kind of team composition here. But what's cool is what we want to do is have each hero have the flexibility to be tailored to the way that you want to build them. So, for example, let's start with Ezrin, right? So wizards can tap into the different sort of schools of magic, the different types of magic. So you could build Ezrin, for example, more as an elemental blaster who's all about dealing damage and AoE. Um, or you could build him more as a support wizard who um, controls the battlefield through transmutation and buffs his allies and harms his enemies through enchantment. Or you could build him as a conjurer who brings allies into the battlefield. With Amiri, we want to tap into those different instinct paths from Pathfinder 2nd Edition. So will you tap into, for example, Dragon Instinct, where you're starting to get some fiery attacks and some really crazy dragon mobility? Or will you go for Giant Instinct because you just want to get, you want to get huge and smash things? Or will you tap into something like Ancestral Instinct, where maybe it's a little bit more tactical and you want to bring some control and protection to the battlefield? Uh, with Kira, you know, of course, clerics are traditionally a support character, but we're going to put that flexibility in there for you to decide if you want Kira to be uh, a support character or not. So, of course, she is great as a healer and a protector, you know, putting protective shields on your teammates to block damage um, or healing them when they take damage. Or you could, for example, so she's a, she's a priestess of the sun. So she has amazing power to blast foes with holy energy and holy fire. Um, so you could make her more of a ranged blaster character. Or, you know, she's also pretty handy with her scimitar and shield. So you could actually build her as a tanky frontliner and have her kind of be the, the party tank. So all that flexibility is in there to do any of that or mix and match from some of those. Maybe she wants some healing and some protection. Or maybe you want to make her have, she's good up close, but also she has some good range potential as well. So that'll be up to you to figure out. And finally... Harsh the Ranger, right? So he's got his dual axes, so he's very deadly up close. 
um, if you want to get into the melee, he's a great damage dealer. Or you could go more into his crossbow, where he really specializes in doing cool crossbow attacks, you know, volley shots, cool stuff like that. And it's really good for those combo attacks we'll talk about a little bit later. Shooting your crossbow attacks through through walls of energy, for example, to charge them with elemental energy. Um, or you could tap into his support capabilities. So he's got animal companions to help control the battlefield. Or will you tap into his sort of tracking skills and his ability to to analyze his foes, where you could maybe see the weaknesses or the hit points of your enemies um, or weaken their defenses so your allies can deal more damage against them. So all of these characters have the ability to tailor them down different paths, different play styles. So, you know, maybe you'll come up, maybe you'll go with a, a really traditional route for your characters, or maybe you guys will mix it up and come up with something really surprising that's going to be for you to decide. That sounds super exciting. Uh, myself, I'm an Amiri kind of player, so I was wondering if you guys have a favorite one. Definitely for me, uh, I love her background. Uh, she had a tragic childhood, but she overcame it. And she's uh, she's no champion of redemption. I, I love her for that. And also for the reasons that Wyatt was mentioning. Uh, on the gameplay side, uh, she's, a, she's great at support, but she, 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 she can heal for instance but she's also war priest and she she can be very powerful at uh, com uh like close combat fighting um and i i like her for this um uh, for both you know you can adapt uh with with this character to a very various situations so uh this is this is why it's my favorite she's my favorite for me yeah, it's got to be ezrin i love to play wizards and ezrin's gonna have um a lot of capability to set up combo moves for his teammates i'm really excited to you know put down that wall of fire and set my teammates up for some huge attacks nice just listening to all of this uh, it's, it's, it's fun just seeing how uh, these characters are being interpreted and all that uh kira is my favorite of the four i've just always loved playing clerics just because they they're so versatile with they can support people they can you know do damage they have and they have like this built-in sort of personality with the deities they worship so it really helps to focus your initial like build for a cleric um so i'm looking forward to seeing how a cura cura plays out i'll probably lead into her burning things to death because <laughs> fire, fire is fun <laughs> that would be a great be party. real good in the abomination vault there's lots of things that don't like the light <laughs> yeah, yeah that's for sure <laughs> and uh will player can expect like any more iconics uh, at the game launch or as gold. So we ha we we plan to have four iconics at launch. Uh, we can uh, can get into uh, details regarding the campaign at this time, but uh, I'm sure I'm sure you'll be interested to to know more. So stay tuned. It, it's going to launch very soon. And, and will we have the ability of making like our own character in the game? So make your own character in the game, and that's for a reason. We chose the iconics because we really want to tell their story. Right, So we have these four characters, these iconics from the world of Pathfinder. We want to bring them in and have players go along on their story and, and their discoveries as they go through, learning about why they've come to the Abomination Vaults, um, what their perspectives are that they bring to the table in terms of what's going on, bring their voices, right? So we really want players to be able to come along with the ride and learn about these characters that we've chosen. We think that's going to be really exciting and helps us figure out how, how we want to set up their progression, for example. And as per their attacks or spells, uh, what can player can expect in the game? So um, Abomination Vaults will have, players will have an arsenal of powerful moves they can use to strategically affect the battlefield. You know, everything from jumping strikes and spinning attacks, powerful heavy things on Amiri and blasts on Ezra, and all the stuff that you would expect. Um, we want to pull a lot of the powers that we have directly in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Um, we think a lot of that's going to translate, and where it doesn't translate, we might try to tinker with things and figure out how to bring that over. Um, but if we found, find a really great opportunity, a little gap that we can fill, we might come up with some of our own power. So if we say, oh man, wouldn't it be cool if Amiri could do that? It's like, yeah, all right, let's, let, let, let's bring that in as well. So you're going to see a lot of Pathfinder, maybe some of our own things as well. Um, the goal is ultimately to give players a lot of tools, a lot of toys to play with in terms of their character so that they really feel like every battle is like a, a playground of destruction and players can find their own ways to get through it. I think fans will be happy to hear that. Um, and could you tell us more about the replayability of the game? 
Really important, right? So um, first of all, again, we have these four characters. So we have four characters, different play styles, and then there's different play styles within each of those characters. So there's a lot right there. Just being able to play through, try the different characters, try the different play styles, there's a lot to sink your teeth into. But on top of that, we also have plans for a new game plus mode, which would let you take your character after you finish the campaign, bring them back to the beginning, and play through the game again with an increased difficulty with all of your goodies unlocked, all of your abilities that you had unlocked come with you into that next run. Awesome. That's exciting. Um, now part two for the for, for our little uh, panel. Um, let's jump into the storytelling. Uh, why did we choose the abomination vaults like what is, it's an adventure path that is really great uh so, so what what like there must be more of it so the, could you explain why we chose the this one yeah so first of all um i had you know we had uh carte blanche to choose whichever pathfinder adventure we thought was going to be cool so I looked through a ton of different, I looked through the whole Paizo, I had the whole Paizo catalog of every adventure and a giant list, it was insane. I had access to everything. And I went through like a like hundred different things, flipping through, going online, seeing what resonates, like what do people love, and trying to find something that I thought was going to work perfectly for a hack and slash. And I also knew that you know, people love this adventure, so there was definitely something there. Um, after we, we looked at a lot of options, it took a while to narrow it down because there were so many good choices. But at the end of the day, we said, this adventure feels perfect for the type of game we want to make. One mega dungeon um, and just a really kind of clean, classic path of there's a villain at the bottom. Let's get in there and find out what's going on. So it just felt absolutely perfect for what we wanted to do. Awesome. And now I, I'll let you, James, explain a bit like the the story of the Abomination Vaults from its origin for our audience and like better understand the context of the game. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, we were we've done a, a couple of adventure paths already uh, at this point for second edition Pathfinder, and they were kind of all over the place. There's like one where you play circus performers. There's one where you're like investigators tracking down a serial killer. Um, there's a lot of uh, really kind of outlandish storylines that are fun to tell because, you know, they, they stretch the, the stretch the expectations of what a fantasy game can do. But we really wanted to have this classic sort of dungeon delving adventure and the whole concept of like the mega dungeon where there's multiple levels and there's all sorts of monsters and traps and hazards and strange discoveries and treasures. Uh, was just, it's just kind of built into the core of the uh, RPG experience. So we we really wanted to do something with that. Um, the idea of Abomination Vaults basically came about when uh, we wanted to have it set in kind of the ground zero, like the center of the map of our campaign setting, the inner sea uh, campaign uh, region. And uh, choosing just outside of, we didn't want it to be like inside of this huge city of Aslan because there's too many resources for the clickers. We want them to struggle to start and kind of build their way up. So we, we built Atari and the Abomination Vaults kind of from the ground up for this whole thing. And um, it was, we had three different great authors. Uh, my, I wrote one third of the adventure pad. Uh, Vanessa Hoskins wrote the second half and Stephen Radney McFarland wrote the third half, all of which were uh, basically brought together and developed into one cohesive whole by Ron Lundin, uh, one of our developers. And uh, it was fun working with them too. I, I designed all of the original maps for Abomination Vaults and, and the town of Atari itself so that everybody had like sort of a, a shared area to start with to build their encounters and the goal was to build a a mega dungeon where you could go any way you want you could go downstairs early you could turn left right there was no like sort of one true way through the entire dungeon to the bottom to face the main villain um but we also really want it was really important to me to build into the uh, dungeon storylines you know uh, encounters with uh, uh something more interesting than just kicking the door and kill the monster so a lot of these there's factions of different creatures lurking in the dungeon there's storylines that you can discover as like you explore and uh kind of find out what really is the cause of the abomination vaults there's a lot more to do in the dungeon than just uh, fight monsters and take their stuff so that i think is is the reason one of the main reasons why the uh, adventure has really resonated with a lot of players because there's this perception that dungeon crawls are kind of old-fashioned and maybe not as as fun 
But uh, I disagree with that. I think that you can put a lot of storyline and different, like every room has to have a purpose and there's what happens in room A needs to impact what's going on in room B and C and all of that. So it's just really fun to pull it all together. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted that it's uh, resonated with a lot of people. And and on top of that, I'm excited that uh, you guys chose this one because uh, it's, it's always a delight just seeing these, sort of stories and characters and creatures and stuff we create for a specific kind of play experience the tabletop experience and then translate it into something different i mean even going into video games we've had a couple of videos before that really kind of capture the, the the traditional style but i'm excited to see something you know like like you're saying more hack and slash where it's like they're the world of, of galarian is, is big enough to include all sorts of different styles of play so looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with nice and and could you tell us more a bit about Belcora or Gunflight and the Rose Guard and then, like the, the world building around it? Yeah, uh, I try. I'll try not to do too many spoilers here, but um, <laughs> we we knew we wanted to have a villain that uh, was on screen kind of from the start, and that's tough to do because once you throw in, especially in a tabletop game, if you put the villain in the very first encounter, they're either going to destroy the party or the party's going to figure out a way to defeat them, and then you don't have an entire campaign. So with Belcora, making her um, a ghost basically allows us to have her legend already kind of steeped into the region. She's like these creepy nursery rhymes about her. Um, there's there's old paintings of her inside the dungeon, and you can kind of look as you go through the dungeon. You can pick piece together her storyline, both through her and through these other previous heroes who uh, faced off against her. And and um, on top of that, the fact that she's got this sort of weird lighthouse type thing in the middle of a swamp where you wouldn't expect to see a lighthouse but this lighthouse again i'm not trying to get too too many spoilers but this light that comes out uh, of uh, a gauntlet which is the name of the the structure has these eerie supernatural powers that really kind of make uh it apparent that there's something devious and sinister going on in the dungeon and by having that basically take place at the top of the dungeon but have that extend all the way down through all 10 levels below you kind of build into the dungeon a reason for the player characters to go and explore each level because each level is like a new layer of this 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 necromantic conjuration super weapon that she's trying to turn on and, and uh cause mayhem in the town of atari and beyond so there's also a lot of other stuff again i don't want to get too spoilery but there's just a lot of deep deep history with like how her goals tie into the city of absalom and there's uh this ancient uh, a deity, evil deity she worships that has other ties to all sorts of other stuff. It's, it's all but like just strands of spaghetti all <laughs> building up this big kind of in the background situation. Um, and that's one of the things I really like about this type of world building experience because you build one adventure here, but there's other things in other adventures that's like, oh, I remember Belcora worshiped this deity, and now there's more going on with that deity in this other side thing. And it's, it makes a kind of a everything bigger than the sum of its parts, I guess. And just hearing you talk about it, I, I'm already pumped to see it uh, see it live. And and why it, like, how does this story could translate in our game and now getting this whole story? Yeah, yeah so I mean, yeah. we want to bring as much of that story over to the game as we can. That's the goal, right? So we want to immerse people in this adventure. So our game takes place uh, with, you know, we've chosen these four heroes who are going to be arriving that the players will be playing as. Um, they're going to be venturing to Gauntlet Keep, uh, which has, again, uh, as James said, the the light uh, of Gauntlet has has lit again. So it's the signal that as Bill Korobak, we need to go in there and figure out what's going on because it's definitely a bad uh, omen. So they'll be going in there and discovering the Abomination Vaults and going deep down underneath the earth to face her. Uh, and along the way, we have planned to try to imbue important choices within each chapter of the game that you'll need to make reflecting the types of choices that are in the tabletop version of the adventure so we want to bring as much of that over as we can so long after the christmas bridge the ammunition vaults hidden beneath, beneath the keep right it's it's is that right uh, and um the place where world has never been um so they, they need to face this army, uh, the secret army of darkness, and discover what's being, what what has uh, happened during those 500 years, and uh, find out what they've been doing all that time. Um, so I, I personally like 
the 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 book is in, insane <laughs> it's uh, it's so good it's, it's so nice to read and all the little details uh inside it that uh covers all of all the the place of the of this big big dungeon um so it's full of dark secrets that players will uh i, I think feel the, the, the pleasure of discovering all the little corners and 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 make the links between the different places i i think it's great and i also love the fact that it's not like straightforward it's 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 it, you you can uh adapt your your strategy you can actually choose different uh, ways of 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 uh, defeating uh the the different uh enemies and finding your ways your own ways uh throughout this uh this dungeon i love that awesome uh yeah, so we established that this is this is a rich story. It's really like it's really fun to explore. But let's talk about gameplay elements. Um, you guys mentioned that we're a, a hack and slash, and we cannot ignore the comparison of games like Diablo Four. So could we elaborate on how it, com it compares to other actions RPGs? Absolutely. So the first thing I like to say is, you know, we're not trying to compete with Diablo Four, right? Because that wouldn't be the right thing to do with Pathfinder. Uh, that wouldn't be the right thing to do with Abomination Vaults. Diablo 4 isn't Pathfinder. It's not the Abomination Vault. So what we want to do is we want to find our space. We, need, we, need, we want to do what we need to do to make a great game that honors Pathfinder and the Abomination Vaults. So for us, that means a smaller but more richly realized and handcrafted experience, which we feel is a much better way to capture what makes Pathfinder and the Abomination Vault's great. So to us, that means strong storytelling and engaging characters, really building up our characters. Uh, a focused adventure built around a single mega dungeon, getting that right, really bringing that to life as best we can. An emphasis on thoughtful and skillful play rather than grinding and farming. We'd rather give you interesting encounters that make you think rather than a million encounters that are all the same. Uh, handcrafted levels and encounters for a thoughtfully designed and curated experience. Um, an emphasis on teamwork and cooperation. Um, supporting your team should be meaningful and highly impactful. And this is something that other action RPGs totally miss out on, right? Like it's all offense, it's all damage, and there's nothing for supporting your team in most of these games. We want to build something where you have a lot of tools to be able to support your allies. Those, those options should be there, and they should be powerful. That's our vision. Um, and a tight experience that's designed to emphasize the combat and the story rather than you know grinding to find that epic drop or managing your inventory space. Uh, that's good to hear. I think fans and James <laughs> are happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, and Pierre, next question for you: Like, is uh, is the game a multiplayer experience? Yes, it is. It is a multiplayer experience. You can play up to four players at the same time. It's a co-op adventure, um, and uh, the game also can be enjoyed single player if you want to play solo. Uh, and the challenges will be adjusted. We're actually working uh, to find a. Um, to, there are many ways in the game industry, and I've been working on uh, co-op games before with several characters, and, and it, there are many ways to make uh, the game great, even if you play solo, uh, even having like combo effects, uh, even if you play solo. So it, it's we won't go in details now at the moment because the, the elements of the game design are being written at the moment, but uh, you can definitely play uh, solo or uh, with uh, three other friends. And so I like that's it. This is a pain point. I know you said it like probably three times in your answer, but like I just want to reaffirm it. This game could be played solo, right? You can play solo. <laughs> yes, you can. All right. And do we absolutely need like it's a it's an online game? Do we absolutely need an internet connection to play? No, at all. You can play. You can you can install. You can download the game at home and and go in the in your remote chalet if you want <laughs> and play without internet connection if you want uh, uh, as soon as you download the game a flight adventure <laughs> yes. or online. yes 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 you can you can, you can your laptop get, get your laptop go in the mountains on your tent and you will play play alone solo in a mountain if you want <laughs> awesome thank you pia uh, so and and why it's for you this one uh, will it be like a drop in drop out kind of uh, multiplayer game or like do we have to create a session of like this is a single player session. This is a multiplayer session. How does it work? First of all, there's always so much frustration in co-op in some games where, oh, you know, 
sorry, it's my single player file. So if we'd have to start the game over, if you want to play with me or, oh, sorry, I'm high level and you're low level. You'd have to start, you'd have to make a new character and I'm already level eight. So sorry, we can't play together. Those frustration points, our goal is to get all of that out of the way. So the first thing is we want to have a drop in, drop out approach where if you want to jump in with your friend, people can jump in, right? When you're between levels, someone can just jump straight in. Um, they can they can join right in if they sh show up while you're playing. So so people will be able to come in and leave as they want. The difficulty of the game will scale to handle that. Um, and on top of that, it's always frustrating, again, like I said, with levels. Oh, I'm high level, you're low level, stuff like that. What we want to do is as you progress your save file, the party's level is dictated by what you've accomplished in the game. So if the party is level five and you join me in my save file, then you pick a character and you're level five, I'm level five, everyone will be level five. So all you got to do is you just got to pick your abilities, uh, put on your gear and you're good to go. Let's play, let's have some fun, right? So the goal is to bring all those barriers down and make sure no matter what, if your friend wants to play with you, if you want to play with someone, or your friend can no longer make it, you're going to be able to do what you need to do to have a great time. That's the goal. Awesome. And I want to jump into like the combat system of the game. Uh, could you tell a bit more about that, Wyatt? Uh, yeah. So combat is designed to feel powerful and rewarding, of course, uh, while still celebrating the Pathfinder core that's going on there. So. What we want to do is we want to capture as many of the ideas from second edition as we can and translate that into the way that combat works uh, as much as possible where it makes sense. Um, so especially that means for the classes, the class design, their powers, but also for the monsters, their powers, their strengths and weaknesses, and for the bosses as well. We're going to look at the bosses, look at their powers in the book, see how we can translate that, what we can translate into the hack and slash um, to bring all of that to life in the game. Um, and on top of that, you know, we're going to build these encounters again, like I said, to encourage teamwork. Um, we want to build a game where teamwork feels very impactful and it doesn't feel like this, oh, well, you know, I could, but why should I? Like, it should really feel valuable and powerful. That's the way we want to build our game. True thought, right? <laughs> yeah. And I, Pia, what's, uh, do you have anything more to add on this? Oh, yeah. There is definitely something I love in the in the current design. It's the combo effect system, which means um, make make the heroes uh, able to create um, to combine their forces to create special unique uh, effects. I'm I'm going to give a couple of examples. So you could see in the trailer that um, um, one of the characters creates a, um, a firewall, and another one, another uh, a hero. Uh, um, spins through that firewall to create a flame vortex. Uh, you could shoot, um, uh, you could create a f like frost bolts uh, by um, multi-shoot crossbow bolts in, uh, through a freezing fog, fog, for instance, or you could uh, cast uh, lightnings on a protective barrier to create electrified personal barrier that would shock nearby enemies. And I, I love uh, the fact that players will actually discover some of them randomly and just go, what, what did I do? What, what, what did we do? Can, can we can we try it again? And, and then they, 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 find, they find out how to, uh, like this, the sum of the two is way more than two. You know, it's, it's when, when doing it great, when timing it properly, you're going to have combo effects that are going to be completely uh, dreadful, <laughs> dreadful. So it's going to, um, I, I like the emergence uh, way of uh, the combo uh, effect system to an uh, emergent way to uh, um, to show up in the game. Um, so it, it's what I would call like emergent gameplay somehow. But um, uh, yeah, so the, the discovery of that and also the mastery of that amongst, uh, all along the, the progression is it's easy, like come out easy to do because it's it will occur quite ran randomly in the beginning because players would wouldn't know how to do it. And then after some time, players will learn how to trigger that at the exact moment they want in a very specific combat. So uh, yeah, I'm thrilled about that feature. Awesome. Um, question we get quite a bit, and it's uh, I, I think it's a, 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 a like a stressful point for, for fans, is how can we tell people that this will feel like a Pathfinder game? Because we know like hack and slash isn't necessarily like a tabletop RPG. So uh, Wyatt, what's your, what's your take on it? 
So I see Pathfinder is divided into two halves. The first half is the world of Pathfinder, and that's the people, the places, the ancestries, the spells, the monsters, the dungeons, heroes, villains, and gods, etc., that comprise the world. And these are the things that if you were a person who lived in this world, you would recognize those things as part of the world that you live in. Um, we want to draw very heavily, certainly from this side, as much as possible. We want to translate that world, bring it to life in our game, and that's going to be very straightforward. Um, the second half is the systems of Pathfinder. So those are the rules that are set up to allow players to interact with the world um, in a tabletop format. Armor class, hit points, three actions per turn, um, rounds, initiative. You know, these facilitate interacting with the world in a tabletop format of Pathfinder. Um, so for this category, our vision is to leverage the Pathfinder 2nd Edition rule set wherever it can bring richness and authenticity to the experience. And where it doesn't, we're not going to force it. So for example, we want to leverage the existing designs of classes. We want to use the feats and spells and powers that are already there as much as we can, uh, as well as for our heroes and monsters and bosses. Um, we will need to adjust certain things to make those things work correctly in this format. So we'll be doing that. Um, and other elements of Pathfinder 2nd Edition, some of those rules won't make sense. So for example, wizards can only cast a, a handful of spells when they're you know, level one or two. And it, wouldn't it be terrible to cast a couple spells as a wizard and then you're just, you're done. <laughs> you're done for the hour, right? <laughs> so, um, so that's the type of thing that maybe we say, all right, we're going to go away from the rules a little bit. Wizards need to be able to cast their spells as they go through the dungeon. So we're going we're gonna to unlock that for them. Then other things, we want to we wanna figure out how to bring it over if we can. right? So things like armor class initiative, um, rolling damage dice, like, like having our damage be in the form of die rolls um, behind the scenes, perhaps. Those are things that are really interesting to us. We want to see what we can come up with. But again, if it doesn't make sense, if it's not fun, we're not going to force that over to the hack and slash format. That's the goal. So in the end, these those tabletop roots are going to feel clearly present, but in a way that fits the genre of game that we're making. Awesome. The gameplay loop. Yeah. So first of all, as I mentioned with that drop in, drop out approach, um, you start off, you know, everybody can pick their character, pick, pick, pick which character you want to play so that we know how many players there are. We'll scale the difficulty based off of that. So if it's one versus four, obviously, we might want to have a different difficulty set up for you. Um, and once you're in, you're in the town of Otari. From there, you can get make sure everybody's ready with all the stuff they need. And then um, you'll be able to bring up the dungeon map and choose which level you want to go in based on how far in the dungeon you've got. So you'll be able to choose your level, go into that level, play that level. If you fail, you know, you're kicked back to town. You're going to have to try that again because... You know, we're going to rewind. It's a game over. Um, but uh, if you succeed, then you're going to be bringing back that treasure that you got, and you're going to bring be bringing back some experience. Uh, at certain points, of course, you're going to be leveling up. We'd like those level ups to happen at the end of levels or chapters so that you can come back to town with your friends, and everyone just leveled up. So now everyone can take a few minutes to look at the new abilities they can choose from, look at those new feats. Um, Look at the gear, right? Figure out their new strategy, their new loadout, and get ready all at the same time rather than in the middle of the dungeon. Oh, you know, Jim just leveled up. Hold on, guys. I need I need 10 minutes. I just need to read my abilities. And everybody else is standing there in the middle of the dungeon like, come on, man. We want to play. So, so that's how we want to handle that. Um, and we really, it's like we want to keep it straightforward in that regard. So we don't want to have a crazy loop here. It's straightforward. We want to do a dungeon crawl. And you can go back to town to figure your stuff out. So we don't want to overcomplicate it with daily rewards or five-hour crafting timer where you have to come back tomorrow. None of that junk. Let's just get straight to the point. Let's get to the action. Let's, let's play our game. Uh, fight, get treasure, power up, uh, repeat with quest and story alongside that the entire time. Awesome. That sounds fun. <laughs> and um, I know we brushed it a little, a little bit before, but... Uh... Could you get deep, deep, dive deep uh, on the customization possibilities that we give players? 
Yeah, so first of all, I mentioned a little bit about how you can build the characters in different ways. And you'd be doing that through the feats you get when you level up, just like in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Um, we'd love to see if we can get in those different types of feats. So the class feats, ancestry feats, skill feats, all of that would be awesome to be able to get in if we can. Um, but you're going to have those options available to you, those feat points. You'll be able to spend them to steer your character into the kind of character you want your iconic to be. Um, and we want that to reflect, again, how it works in Pathfinder 2nd Edition as much as we can. Um, however, we might rework just a little bit because we want to make sure that as you get into the higher levels, you don't feel, especially if you're not a Pathfinder player, you don't feel overwhelmed by the number of options available to you. It's really fun in Pathfinder when you get to high level and you have 100 options of feats to choose from, but... Um, we want to make sure, we'll, we, we may want to make sure that players don't feel overwhelmed when they get to that point, and that they can look at a handful of choices, make that choice confidently, and then go back into playing dungeon with their friends. Um, but ultimately, it should look like what's in second edition. Um, and again, you're going to be able to create a, like a more of a specialized character or hybrid. So you could mix and match. Maybe you want to make, um, maybe you want Ezrin to do some conjuration, but also some, you know, enchantment. So you'll be able to mix and match those different things. Um, on top of all that, there's customization you'll be able to do in town. So you'll be able to upgrade your gear, for example. Some of the advanced shopkeepers we have in our stretch goals that have add even more customization on top of that, if we can get them in. Um, things like changing, you know, what element is imbued into your weapon and stuff like that. Um, and those different weapons that you're getting in the dungeon, are balanced against each other. They're designed to be fairly equal to each other. So it's not, it's fun, but it's not an interesting choice when you go from a plus one longsword to a plus two longsword. You go, yeah, okay. There's no choice to be made here. I'm going with the plus two. So what we want to do is we want to set up that, okay, I've got the fire longsword, but I just got the ice longsword and they do different things and they're good against different enemies. And actually the enemies that are weak to ice are actually giving me a hard time, and I think there might be some of them on the next level. Maybe maybe I'll switch to that Ice Longsword. I don't know. Well, the fire could be really interesting, too, for some of the combos I want to do, right? So we want to set up those interesting choices for our players with the weapons by designing them to be balanced, be an interesting choice. You're growing that arsenal as you go deeper and deeper. You get more options to choose from. So lots of different ways to customize your play style and your strategy before you jump back into the next floor. Nice. And talking about strategy, uh, Pierre, could you tell us a bit more about the roles and teamwork that we could uh, see in the game? I can actually cover that one. Yeah, I think yeah. it's... Um, so so <laughs> rather than pigeonholing, our vision is to leave it up to the players, like I said, to define their role on the battlefield. So as I said, you know, Kira makes a great support character, but she could also be a great blaster or a great frontliner. Um, so the question is, for example, will you build a balanced classic team or would you come up with something really surprising and unconventional um that's in your hands to figure out um on top of that you know like i said we really want to lean into the idea of teamwork so you could imagine um shielding your teammate when they're about to take that killing blow right uh, throw the bubble on them to save them at the last second or that boss is protected from the front I'll I'll tank, I'll grab their attention so that you guys can sneak behind them and attack them in the back where they're vulnerable. Or, oh my God, ah, I'm being mind controlled. I, I can't control my character. Someone break me out. And Amiri, you know, leaps across the battlefield, jumps over the enemies and smashes that caster in the back line that's mind controlling you to break that spell so that you regain control. So we want to set up that need for teamwork, that value of the teamwork to have the, the best results in battle. Um, and we feel like that experimentation, that discovery, and those teamwork elements are what makes this a Pathfinder experience, right? Pathfinder is about the party. It's about the team. It's about the, and it's about those elements of discovery and, um, and you know, Heroic surprising the dungeon too, yeah. master. We're sort of the dungeon master, but, you know, throwing out the rules and coming up your own of, with your own way of getting through those encounters. Uh, we want to put that. We want to put that in the hands of the players and let them find their way through. Nice. Uh, sorry, Pierre. I, I, I scared. <laughs> That's fine. May you I see how, you. <laughs> how can how can it can't it be fun to work with such such a, a, a you know why you know so so much about Pathfinder is so 
uh, energetic about Pathfinder. It's <laughs> it's it's uh, it's a, every day is a bliss. <laughs> Yay! Uh, I want to talk about the style and artistic approach that we have uh, towards the game. Sure. So, um, you know, we we currently working on. But we, we worked already on, on this, but we have tuning it to find the right tone and atmosphere for uh, that reflects the story and setting of uh, Pathfinder. Um, so w what we uh, what we want to create as environments is to for them to, to feel vivid and unique um, with uh, the color, the fog, the ambient lighting, um, so that every um, biome, every part of the dungeon feels unique. You know, if you are in a uh, period prison, you would have a orange glow to fit the so that you can uh, feel the heat of the fires in the caverns there are those pink and purple spore clouds etc etc et so the, what what we want is that you you definitely um feel and you know where you are as as soon as you see the overall ambience of the uh, of the different environments so it's it's our it's our goal like that for them to feel unique and what what about the vfx so <laughs> good visual effects are um, are really important to a game like this. Um, our goal is to bring the abilities of the heroes and the abominations to life with really strong visual effects to reinforce that feeling of danger and excitement, the spectacle of combat, right? Um, and also, it's going to be so much fun to look at those Pathfinder spells and translate that into you know visual spectacle. So figuring out what how we want those spells to look in our game is going to be a lot of fun. So uh, I'm a big fan of visual, but I'm an even more big fan of music and ambiance, of sound design. So what can we expect from the game? Uh, I can talk about that. Um, you know, I've I've been working for some time in 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 for um, very dark games like survival horror games and so on. So I really feel that um, being in the in the abomination vaults, we need to create something that is about sensations. You know, it's not. There is a gameplay that is a huge part uh, uh, of immersion, of course, but at the same time, you need to you need to see, you need to feel, and the, the sound helps you feel things, and um, so it, it really helps the immersion. Uh, if you are in a, in a specific environment, like a very uh, lot of wet, um, moist, and you, you need to hear the drops of of water here and there, and more importantly, I think the foreshadowing of things is super important in this kind of games. Um, even if you want to find a balance between something like you know the visually um, um, between the cat, uh, something not not too much cartoony, not too much dark, but still like the what 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 I what I learned with the uh, survival horror games. And it's definitely not a survival horror games, but when you you can use foreshadowings in many many types of games, and and it's it, it's the sound, the audio helps a lot. So imagine that you. You first encounter an enemy that are very, very that have a very specific sound, and it was very hard to fight. And then after some time, you just hear that sound, but they're they're not here. You know, what my, you you keep you keep your gun. You know, you you're very you so you know it's coming. You know, don't know exactly when. So it, it puts the, this foreshadowing and the, the ambience helps you immerse in the in the game, and also a, a very big part of the game of. Of course, on the uh, on the audio side is the music. So the music um, will adapt to the um, intensity of the combat, and it will it writes itself somehow. So when the combat ends, then you have an, a, a music outcome. So it's the feeling of accomplishment is enhanced by the music and sound. Yeah. So the the beginning, a little bit like of a combat to 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 the end, um, everything is like your um, you do travel in this uh, in those abomination vaults with the with the gameplay, with the visuals, and also with the sound and music. And I'll add on to that. Um, we don't know all the details of what we'll be able to do yet with voiceover, but our goal is to be able to voiceover as much or all of this game as possible, right? Um, our characters, we want them to come to life through their voice. So voice acting could be a big part of how players will discover who the heroes and villains really are. Um, because they're telling their story as you're going through the dungeon. You know, the dream is 
as you're battling through the dungeon, the characters can react, use their voice. We don't want to pause the combat and make you read things when that's happening. We want to bring all that to life with the character's voice. So as you're battling through, as you're encountering the boss or fighting the boss, when you get to that a giant set of stone doors and how do the four characters react when they get to that moment, we'd love to bring all of that to life through voice acting. And one final question. <laughs> uh, why did we choose Kickstarter? <laughs> So the Kickstarter is an opportunity, first of all, for BCOM to see if the Pathfinder community and the gaming community are as excited about what we've been talking about as we are. Um, Kickstarter is just the beginning. Um, the pledges that people make will help support the game and help it be the biggest game possible. Um, and also, it's a great way for us to start hearing from the community, learning what's resonating with people, start to get their opinions and ideas and feedback. So yeah. so it's a great way for us to to start this journey into seeing if we can build this game. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Wyatt. For, for me, it's the first time I'm, I'm working uh, on a production where we have a, a Kickstarter. I, I think it's a great way to uh, get the feedback from the community to make the game stronger, deeper more meaningful um so it's a it's a vehicle for that and i think i think so far it's so far so good it's uh, the the communication with the community is just great it, it makes the game better every day so awesome. thank you so much Pierre and wyatt uh for all the details in the game i'm sure the pathfinder community is super hyped about this uh and james it was a pleasure having you uh you're, yeah <laughs> It was great hearing you talk about your story. It's uh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, it's just exciting to uh, just see what you guys are are, are planning for it. Um, I had one real quick question, and if you can't talk about it, that's cool. Um, <laughs> one of the uh, I'm not trying to throw a curveball. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite parts of this type of game is the exploration element. So, is there going to be a lot of like finding secrets and like uh, shortcuts and and exploring this? Is exploring the dungeon going to be as as important a part of the play as just fighting in the dungeon or is it going to be mostly focused on on, on the combat? Well, I, I definitely think there's going to be a little bit of focus on the combat just because of the hack and slash nature. Sure. But we definitely want to have capture as many of those secrets as possible. I love the idea of shortcuts. You know, we want to have hazards on the map, hidden treasures. It's a big Perfect. part of what makes these types of dungeon crawls great. You know, some mm -hmm. maybe some hidden doors for you to pass through to avoid some encounters. We want to yeah. get all that stuff in there, and we have some ideas for maybe how a skill system could feed into that. Oh, cool. So, so yeah, so that could be uh, a big opportunity. No, nice. so, no not too much spoilers. <laughs> 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 well, thank you so so much, guys, uh, and everyone. Don't forget to press the notify me button on our Kickstarter page. Uh, campaign launch launches very soon, so uh, we can't uh, can't wait to share more details about it. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. See you guys.